And so we're going to move to our next speaker, uh, who will be uh, Mindy Liu Perkins, who is postdoctoral fellow in the Justin Crocker's lab at Embol. Uh, so I'm going to, Mindy, can you share your screen? Um, yes. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, it seems to work. So I'm going to uh, switch off my camera and microphone, and then you have 12 minutes. Great. Thank you for the introduction. So this work was actually started while I was still a PhD student at Berkeley, which is why we're going to have the Berkeley logo on all of the slides here. And we're going to be taking a much more microscopic approach than we just saw in Simon's work. So hopefully this is an interesting compliment. So it's my pleasure to be discussing our preprint, a bistable autoregulatory module in the developing embryo commits cells to binary fates. And in keeping with today's theme, a central question in developmental biology concerns cell fate determination, or really how cells that are initially identical can differentiate into extremely diverse forms in an adult organism. So cell fate determination is sometimes thought of as a series of binary decisions between turning a given gene on or off. And the genetic networks that can make these decisions may be thought of as memory modules or as switches that lock cells into one of two pathways. So there are multiple genetic network motifs that are capable of acting as switches, but the simplest such motif is positive autoregulation, in which a protein binds its own enhancer and promotes its own expression. So in this case, transient upstream factors set the state of the switch to off or on, and then the presence or absence of the gene thereafter locks the state into on or off. Now, positive autoregulation alone is not actually enough for a network to be able to act as a switch. So we get switch-like behavior from the mathematical property of bistability, which depends on the quantitative kinetic rates in the system, including the binding and unbinding rates of protein to DNA, the production and degradation rates for mRNA and protein, and also how strongly the protein promotes its own expression. So although positive autoregulatory motifs have been found in many systems in developmental biology, particularly for terminal differentiation, there is actually very little quantitative data on the kinetic rates to confirm that an underlying dynamical system that models such a network is actually bistable. So we decided to study this question in the fruit fly embryo. So here we are looking at the expression pattern of a gene called FUTS. And FUTS is a pair rule gene that's expressed in seven stripes that are refined over a period of about 15 minutes before gastrulation into a more or less binary pattern of expression. So FUTS is regulated by two enhancers. There is an early element shown here in blue that binds upstream regulatory factors. And there's an autoregulatory element shown here in red that binds the FUTS protein itself to drive FUTS expression. Now we used live imaging techniques to simultaneously monitor the transcription rate with the MS2 MCP system and the protein concentration with LAMATAG in real time. So here is a video, and you'll see these pink spots emerging are all transcription spots where nascent mRNA is appearing. The green is the FUTS protein concentration, and the cells are all becoming fluid here as gastrulation begins. So we performed all of our measurements for transgenes that were carrying either the full FUTS regulatory locus, so both enhancers together, or just one or the other of the enhancers individually. So in this way, we were really able to distinguish the contributions of the upstream regulatory factors from the contribution of autoregulation to FUTS transcription. So what we found from making these measurements was that expression from the early element drops off at the same time that expression from the autoregulatory element is increasing. So furthermore, we observed that FUTS protein does not drive any expression from the autoregulatory element until 20 minutes before gastrulation regardless of the concentration of FUTS. So this is interesting because it supports a view where there's a temporal handoff in the control of FUTS regulation from the early element to the autoregulatory element right before gastrulation. So based on our experimental observations, we developed a dynamical systems model to predict the mean FUTS mRNA and protein concentrations over time. So we broke our model into two modules. So the first is the early module, which describes how the upstream factors drive FUTS expression by binding the early element. So this describes the mRNA concentrations and the protein concentrations resulting from this regulation. 
Similarly, we define an autoregulatory module to explain how FUTs binding to its own enhancer drives the production of mRNA and there, thereafter the protein. Now note here, we have this parameter T on, which is 20 minutes before gastrulation, just showing that the autoregulatory module is not responsive until that time. So we used data from the literature as well as our live imaging experiments to quantitate each of the parameters in these models. So that would include the mRNA and protein degradation rates, also the translation rate, and perhaps most importantly for us, we were able to characterize this gene regulatory function that describes how strongly FUTS protein activates its own expression. Now I'm gonna note here that we measured these parameters by averaging across nuclei in a set of seven embryos. And for all subsequent analysis I will show you, we used a separate set of three embryos to reduce any bias. So now that we have our model, um, we want to know whether it's actually a good model. So we want to compare it to experimental observations. And to do that, we are going to see whether our model can predict whether a nucleus expresses high or low FUTs at gastrulation based on a measurement taken 20 minutes before gastrulation. So specifically, we are going to make a prediction from that 20 minutes to gastrulation and then possibly simulate afterward. So to give you some idea of how we made these predictions, um, here's a visualization of some nuclei. Um, on the plot on the left, each dot is a nucleus, and the parameter space is the initial conditions at 20 minutes before gastrulation. So here we have the production rate of mRNA, we have the mRNA concentration, and we have the protein concentration. And note, because autoregulation just starts at 20 minutes, that the late module has not produced any protein or mRNA yet, so all of these are just characteristics of the early module. In the middle, we see some example empirical traces for the cells circled in the plot on the left. The first one shows the low FUT state at gastrulation, so the concentration falls below this dashed line, whereas the second and third cells show high FUTs expression at gastrulation. So this empirically measured curve goes above this dashed line at zero. So now we're going to introduce the model. Um, what we're going to do is take these initial condition measurements and then try to simulate traces from there to gastrulation. So just to be able to visualize and connect back to that image we had of the embryo in the beginning, here's an example of a simulated pattern. So on the left, we have the measurements, and on the right, we see that if we start with the same initial conditions, we can also simulate the emergence of this stripe. So that's all well and good qualitatively. Um, can we do it quantitatively? Um, the short answer is yes, pretty decently for many cells. So here in the middle now, what you see overlaid on the dark green experimental traces are these lighter traces from the simulation. So the light green is the total FUTS concentration, which we have broken down into the contributions from the early and late elements in blue and red, respectively. So already we can see, at least for the example cells that we're showing here, that we can accurately predict the binary state of FUTS expression at gastrulation for all of these cells. And also we can nicely predict at least what we can measure of this curve. So this gives us a little bit of confidence that even this deterministic dynamical system can pretty well predict a stochastic trajectory for nuclei that are in completely separate embryos from the ones we did our measurements. So having established that we have at least a little bit of faith in our model, around gastrulation, we can now simulate these traces past gastrulation and see what happens over long time scales. So see what kinds of steady states for gene expression that we reach. And we notice immediately that we have at least two possible fates in this system. So both cells one and two end up having low FUTs at long time scales and cell three ends up having high FUTs at a long time scale. So this is one example of a signature of bistability, which is what we were looking for in our system. We performed some other more formal analysis to show that these were the only two steady states, stable steady states for this system. Now, one interesting thing to note here is that cell two, although it has high FUTs at gastrulation, has low FUTs at long time scales. So these, these cells differing only in their initial conditions end up with what appears to be the same state at gastrulation, but really might not correspond to the same fate past gastrulation. Um, 
we're showing here some simulated traces just for three different nuclei, but we can also observe this pattern if we look across all of the nuclei that we sampled. So here now in this plot on the right, we have all of the same nuclei that we've plotted on the left. And these surfaces divide the nuclei into those that are off at gastrulation um, from those that are on at gastrulation. And then the green surface separates those that are off at long time scales from those that are on at long time scales. So all of these blue nuclei here are these kind of cell two like behaviors that are transiently on. And we would have to perform further experiments to try to confirm whether this actually happens in the embryo, but it was interesting to see as a result from our simulations. What was also interesting about having these transiently but not permanently activated cells was that it suggests cells really take a while to decide what their fate is going to be. And furthermore, that that time is longer than the 20 minutes that we made our measurements. Because again, if we thought the decision was only made in 20 minutes, then the cell that was apparently on at time zero should have been on at an infinite time. And in fact, a further analysis of our model suggests that it takes about 34 minutes for the vast majority of cells to correctly decide their fate. I invite you to look into our preprint if you're interested in the details, but I don't think we have time to go into them here. So in summary for this work, we developed a dynamical systems model for FUTS autoregulation and quantified all of the parameters to show that at least in this embryo, in this context, this motif is bistable in vivo. Um, furthermore, we showed that there's temporal coordination between these early and autoregulatory elements that help determine the cell fate. And finally, um, on a more broad modeling scale, we also showed how we can successfully analyze the behavior of a genetic network by breaking it into functional mo modules that we characterize individually. I hope that kind of approach might be able to generalize to other networks. With that, I would like to thank my co-authors, particularly Jake, who did all of the experiments, and Maddie, who designed the fly lines, and of course, Arnon for supervising us, and then our funding sources. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks a lot, Mindy. So there, are, there is a question, at least, uh, again, by uh, Sudin Batakharia. Uh, were the computational model parameters fitted to match the data or empirically derived? Um, so the only parameter that we really fit was the shape of this regulatory function F. So we had enough samples of input FUTs concentration and then output transcription rates to be able to plot a, a curve from sample individual sample points, and then we fit a curve to it. But everything else, so for example, the translation rates, we performed experiments specifically to be able to measure those and to not have to just fit full curves. So we only measured one parameter at a time. OK, a question from Hannah Stewart. Uh, does this model imply that small differences in initial expression levels somewhat pre-bias the cells to stay on or turn off later? Uh, yes, so it does indeed suggest that the initial expression levels can significantly affect the fate. Um, the one thing I will add is that we did not I did not show in this presentation that we had any stochastic dynamics, but we did also run a few stochastic simulations that you could find in the supplement that depending on the size of that initial bias, maybe you won't have much effect. But actually, the deterministic and the stochastic results agree pretty well overall. OK, uh, so there are other questions, but there was a question by a panelist by Kirsten Tentersher. So I'm just going to read it because it was on the other uh, chat. Uh, any ideas about how the early induction goes down and the late one sets in? Yeah, so we think that probably the early one is going down just because the upstream regulatory factors are decaying. Um, that seems the most likely explanation or else some other repressor is coming up. Although I, I think that probably wouldn't happen. I think it's probably just the decay of the upstream factors. Um, for the autoregulatory module, pure speculation, we think there might be some um, chromatin remodeling going on that's making this region accessible that wasn't before. Um, there's some speculation, I think, about the timing factors that have been found to regulate the, the timing of expression of other genes in Drosophila, but we don't have enough evidence right now to say for sure that that's what's happening. <laughs> 
Okay, so I guess that kind of answers also Christian Schroeder question, who is asking, can you speculate on how the responsiveness of the autoregulatory module is controlled? It somehow answers it. I'm just going to read James Briscoe's last question, who is also related to this uh, issue. You mentioned a time scale to reach a decision time of roughly 34 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to elaborate on what determines uh, this time? Why is it 34 minutes? Um, yes, so 34 minutes, th this came a little bit out of our analysis, I'm happy to explain more later, but the, the short answer is that we were varying how quickly the early module shut down and how late the auto regulatory module started, and basically looked at how big we could make that time gap before we would start to change the fate of the cells from what we measured empirically. And that was around 35 minutes. What was also encouraging is that if you look at the dynamical system underlying this and look at the converge local convergence rate to the high steady state, that's also almost like 32 to 34 minutes, depending on what the range is and the parameters. So given that this time scale showed up at least twice through our analysis, we were more confident that it was reasonable. Okay, great. I think we are right on time. So thanks a lot, Mindy, for your presentation.